<laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm here today to talk to you about something that's extremely important for our interconnected global world. It's something that my mom and my grandmother used to tell me was very important as I was growing up, but I didn't realize quite how important it was until recently. I've been doing some research on social capital, which is basically measuring the bonds between individuals within a society. So you might be familiar with things like human capital um, or, or physical capital, which are machines or things that we have in our minds. Okay, so I'm going to talk today about international social capital. So social capital, like I said, represents the bonds between people, the things that tie us together as a community. And these things have become increasingly important as we've developed as a species. When um, we were small family bands working together in small tribal groups, we always cooperated because you were related to the people that were around you. And that's, that's kind of changed over time. Over the last several million years, we've evolved from people that worked in small groups to the people that worked in larger groups. This evolution took you know, millions of years and occurred as a very slow process. And for most of that time, technology proceeded at the same glacial pace. Um, until recently, that is. Now, you might think that technology has been moving quite rapidly for the last several thousand years. But if you're talking about millions of years on scale, then a thousand years is recently. So let's talk about the different kinds of capital that we might want to consider here. So we're all very familiar with physical capital. Everyone understands that you have to build machines to make stuff. And then the machines slowly get used up making other products. We expanded this concept to talk about human capital. So that's the, the skills that people build up, and then they use these skills to produce things. What I want to do today is talk about expanding this concept one step further to talk about the bonds that actually tie people together how important these bonds are, the research that shows that these, these bonds can lead to great outcomes in society, and I want to talk about how we need to expand these bonds to cross national borders. That's something that really the modern world is going to require of us, and I, I don't think that we've really worked at this as a species very hard then. Okay, so as I pointed out, there's been a lot of new technology that's made it much easier to talk to people that it would have been impossible to converse with before. Right, it's free for me to talk to people all around the world. I can talk to them on a variety of different applications. If I want to actually visit someone in person, the cost of that to me is a fraction of what it was 50 years, 100 years ago. And if you think about how much time it takes, it's almost instantaneous now compared to what it used to be. This new world requires new kinds of relationships. And I think it really is a new world. Like we have more information at our disposal. We have a more open and connected world than we've ever had in the past. So all around the world, people have been cooperating for quite some time. And people like to argue about you know, what caused this cooperation. You might talk to different academics about you know, what caused societies to evolve, what caused people to get along together. And what you're going to see is that if you ask five different academics from five separate disciplines, you're going to get at least seven completely different answers. And every one of these answers are going to be fully backed up by peer-reviewed research. So that's, you can't just trust the peer-reviewed research. So let's talk through what some of these fields do. So a philosopher might say the development of morality allowed people to move together into larger groups. Right? And every culture has done something to develop morality. There's many disparate sets of belief all across the world. Researchers at Oxford University, um, some sociologists there, compiled a list of seven universal rules of morality that were present in every culture that they could find. Four of those rules apply directly to human capital, both the buildup and the use of human capital. So what are, sorry, uh, social capital. So what are those four rules, these universal moral rules that apply to social capital? Help your group, return favors, be fair, respect others' property. So this list of things probably sounds like something you were supposed to learn as a child in kindergarten, and, and it should. These are the basic rules of interaction with humanity. If you follow these rules, you will be part of the community. If you don't follow these rules, you will not be a part of the community. If you follow these rules, the community will help you. They will help you achieve your goals. They will help you turn your aspirations into reality. If you don't follow these rules, the community will probably punish you or try to exclude you, not, not provide you with the support networks you need to achieve what you want to achieve. Um, we talked a little bit about how a philosopher might argue that this all came about due to the development of morality. You know, what would, uh, we talked about how sociologists study different cultures around the world and combine things together into uh, common themes that apply to all the cultures and still relate to this social capital. Well, how does an economist approach this problem? So as those of you know that have had me in class, when we talk about economists, we usually talk about how we model everyone as a self-interested, rational agent 
Um, we sometimes call them Homo economicus. We have a name for this sort of subspecies of human that's very unrealistic. A robotic person that examines all information and then solves a complicated optimization problem to maximize their own self-interest. Or if you want to put it mathematically, you could say maximize utility subject to your budget constraint. It's a little, little less exciting. Um, so this Homo economicus doesn't really make sense in the sense of cooperating with society. Why would a selfish person actually help out in society? If I'm just selfish or self-interested, why would I cooperate? Why would I not lie to people? Why would I not cheat my neighbors? Well, the trick is that this is not a game that you just play once. So what economists try to do is they take the lens of game theory and they try to model social interactions using this model of game theory. So you set up a game that has two kind of simple strategies you could follow. One would be cooperate and one would be not cooperate. So cooperate is going to relate to actions like the, this list that I showed you a second ago. Cooperating is helping your group. Cooperating is returning favors. Cooperating is being fair. And cooperating is respecting others' property. Not cooperating is the opposite of these things, being basically a bad person in the community. So why do self-interested individuals actually do good things in these societies? So economists have kind of a clever, at least we think it's a clever, explanation for this. We realize that this game isn't played only once. Like if you just saw someone once, there's not a great incentive to do the right thing for them. But in every society, you actually run into the same people over and over again. And this has been true for millions of years. So you're not playing a game only once, you're actually playing a repeated game. Even an introvert interacts several times a day. And that quickly adds up to several thousand interactions a year. So even an introvert is playing a repeated game. If you fail to follow the rules that we talked about, then people are going to mark you as someone that doesn't cooperate. To put this back into like real world terms, if you're someone that doesn't repay favors, in the future, few people will want to do favors for you. So in this repeated game, when you're playing this game over and over again, there's a lot of theoretical and empirical um, research that shows that what people are actually going to do is follow a fairly simple strategy. It's called tit for tat. And what that means is you cooperate the first time you play the game, and then every time um, you play the game again with the same person, you just copy what they did last time. So this is kind of a clever thing economists thought up, mathematicians thought up, but this is something that you know moral codes and religions across the world have known for thousands of years. It's called the golden rule. You treat others as you want to be treated. I find it kind of amusing, or actually very amusing, that it took economists about 100 years of fancy mathematical models to recover something that most cultures knew for over 1,000 years. If you treat others the way you want to be treated, things will generally go better for you. And that's what you should do, not be a mean, selfish, nasty person that only cares about themselves, despite the fact that that's how we model in economics. So we talked about why people might behave the correct way when um, they're playing a repeated game. And that's exactly what most of society is. I mean, I, I know that this is a, a weird group because you all came to see me talk, but I've seen most of you many times in the past, but even just walking around Boston or Cambridge, I might run into the same person. You know, it is a repeated game that you have with people. You want to avoid being labeled as someone that doesn't cooperate. So how is this changing over time? What, what, what effects do technology have on how important this kind of cooperation is? Well, obviously, we have made quite a few technological innovations that have kind of made the world flat or shrunk the distances between us. You know, now I can step on a plane in a couple of hours, be in a different country, in an entirely different culture. So we need new tools to kind of overcome these problems that we might have. Like, we have a larger group of people, and now it's going to be harder to argue that that's a repeated game. If I'm bouncing to China with 1.4 billion people, if I'm bouncing to South America with almost a billion people, it's hard to guarantee I'm going to run into the same people. So what we need to do is act together as a community and try to actually build international social capital networks. So before I move on to the global part of my talk, I want to talk a little bit more about the types of social capital. So there are really two kinds of social capital, and it's important to keep them separate in your mind because the effects are very different. So the, the best kind of social capital is called bridging social capital. This is the social capital that spans ethnic and socioeconomic classes. It builds bridges between different groups in a community. The other kind of social capital is a little more common and it's easier to build. It's called bonding social capital. This is the kind of social capital you get from people of the same group being together. So um, some examples of this are things like an international student group actually has both kinds of social capital in it. Right, an international student group brings together people from the same country, so that's bonding social capital, but usually those people are from different classes within the country, so that's bridging social capital. So many kinds of groups and organizations actually incorporate both of these. 
We want to focus on building bridging social capital because it's a little better at good outcomes in the real world. It's a more highly correlated, to put that in a more scientific way, it's much more highly correlated with good outcomes when we look at the data from the last 80 years. But in a TED talk, I think I'm supposed to say it a little softer than that. So but it's, it's good. But bridging capital is better than the other guy. Okay, so social capital can also act as a social safety net for people in the community. So this really came home to me when I moved to a small town of 600 people in rural Massachusetts, so very different than the Boston you see out the windows here. So I live in a town of 600 people. The closest gas station is two towns over, uh, using the local dialect, that's how they say it. And it's really amazing to me how the community comes together. What they do is they have, you know, if something bad happens in the community, they have a spaghetti dinner to try to help that person out. So about every month we have a spaghetti dinner to either pay for scholarships for local kids, to defray the cost of medical care for someone that's been hurt, um, or to rebuild someone's barn. That was last month. Their barn burned down, so we had a spaghetti dinner and rebuilt it. So what you can see here is uh, the flyer for the local volunteer fire department. That's my neighbor, the fire chief, in the photo. So we actually fund our fire department with these social capital networks. So a couple of days ago I was having an all-you-can-eat pancake breakfast with these guys to hopefully bribe them to come and put out a fire if I set my chimney on fire again because I think that already happened once. Um, so social capital, as you can see, is quite important for the communities, and what we want to talk about is how to stretch this to, to cover the rest of the world. So what are some ideas for building social capital that might span national boundaries? So I have two good ideas looking at existing kind of frameworks and organizations that might provide these international bridges or international bridging social capital. So one of them is the study abroad program, so that's a pretty common program. I'm sure that some people here at Holt or EF might be familiar with that. Um, and another one that was kind of surprising to me is sports fandom, and I'll, I'll go through these in, in a little bit of detail. So study abroad is, is a big deal in the U.S. There are roughly a million foreign students taking college classes in the U.S. every year. That's about 5% of the U.S. college population. So this has been going up for as long as we have data on it. In 1950, we only had about 30,000 foreign students in the U.S., so we've gone up 30-fold in the last 60 years. That's considerably more than population went up in the last 60 years. So what are the benefits of studying abroad? Well, I don't have to tell most of the Hull students the benefits of this, I hope. I studied abroad as an undergrad, and in that year, I learned more about personal relationships, friendship, and learning about other cultures than I learned in the entire rest of my college combined. Um, it, it kind of surprised me how much I learned, not academically, in that one year. It opened your eyes in a way that it's just really impossible to do by watching something on, on the internet or reading a book about it. Really sitting down, eating, studying, and learning with people from other cultures helps, helps you recognize that they're human beings that share interesting goals with you. They're just like you are. What's really an advantage of this is that it helps people fight the spread of things like nationalism and tribalism that we're seeing more and more in the U.S. and so that's my hope for study abroad programs. Um, of course, I should probably admit I'm a little biased on this one. I do work at an international business school, so of course I'm going to push uh, study abroad programs. But I do think that it would be better for our world moving forward if we continue to support and push study abroad programs. Get young people into another culture. Have them assimilate a little bit. Have them come home and tell everyone about it. It makes it less likely those countries hate each other. It's, it's, it's very simple. And I think my mother and my grandmother really understood this. They actually forced me to participate in many community activities as a child. It was very confusing to me. I didn't understand why I was supposed to quit reading books and go camping with the Boy Scouts. I mean, I, I was a very odd child. I wanted to stay home and read books and not go camping. Um, so it was a very interesting conversation. Uh, last week, I called my mom and said, hey, mom, I'm giving a TED Talk. I'm talking about something that you were right about when I was a kid. I used to complain about all these things you made me do, but all the research says you were absolutely right. If you want to do good things, be in a good community, you should be involved in these community activities. Um, her response was, this was the only interesting research result I have ever communicated to her. So that, was, that was a little brutal. But hopefully she'll watch this talk and get a kick out of it. Um, okay, so the next existing kind of framework we have that might help build these international social bridges is sports fandom. So I'm not a big sports fan myself. So you can imagine my surprise when I went to China last year and spent some time off the beaten path and everyone I met was an NBA fan. That's the National Basketball Association. So basketball is typically a U.S. sport, so it was kind of weird to see everyone I talked to. And I randomly selected them. I didn't wait for them to come to me, so there was no selection bias on that. They all wanted to talk about basketball. Many of them knew more about the NBA than I did. In fact, I was a little embarrassed to admit that, so on the left we have Russell Westbrook, who's a star player for the Oklahoma City Thunder. I only knew his name and that he was a basketball player. 
I didn't know how good he was. I didn't know all the great plays he made. I didn't know his record of triple doubles. But these guys that we met in China told me all about it. So they, they knew very little English, but they spoke the language of basketball. And it really brought us together in a way that I would like to see more of in the real world. So that's what I've got for existing frameworks that we can probably expand to show, uh, to build more international bridges of social capital. What I'd like to see is a way to actually develop new ideas on this. I'm a little cautious about us relying on technology to develop new ways of connecting this. I think that we've seen the dangers of technology in this respect. In fact, the <coughs> social media algorithms actually exacerbate the very worst parts of bonding social capital. Your social media feed tends to only look like the stuff that you agree with. So a way to fight this, the way that I fight this personally, is to make sure I like posts that I absolutely hate and absolutely disagree with. That guarantees that your feed on Facebook or Twitter is going to be balanced. It's going to have new ideas from other people in it. You're not going to be stuck in an echo chamber and not see the other people as human beings. So I'm, I'm worried about just saying, oh, international capital is not a problem because people are just going to be connected over social media. I think when we look at the data on that, what we see are things like dangerous elections and sometimes even genocide spurred by social media in some countries. So I want to leave you guys with um, a quote and a call to action. In 1840, Alexis de Tocqueville wrote, the quality of the democracy can be measured by the quality of functions performed by its private citizens. I think we can expand this quote to apply to more than just democracies because this applies to all government forms now. What we need to see are connected citizens making good decisions in all countries. And I think to do this, what we're going to have to do is get out there and actually build international social capital bridges, uh, building on the sports fandom and study abroad, and develop some new techniques. Hopefully, some entirely new thing will come up that we do not yet know about, that will connect people in a way that we have not yet foreseen. Thank you for your attention and time.